the whole art house up there. They're playing Doom Generation tonight. They're also sold out. Mm. Um, you know, what has been Greg's reaction to all these screens that are popping up that are packed like this? Like, and your reaction as well. Um, I mean, both of, I mean, honestly, both of us are blown away. I can't believe this is a full theater right now, yeah. honestly. Um, and bringing this movie back around all these years later, that, how many people here have seen Doom Generation before? Okay, wow, so that's like half a thing. How many people are here seeing it for the first time? That's it. See, this is what Greg and I are impressed about, is that there's half the theaters still coming back to see it because you guys love the movie, and half of you are here because you're discovering it for the first time. You've heard about it, or people have talked about it, and here you are. And for the film, or anything you make, really, to be quite honest, have a life like that, is for us beyond anything we could have imagined. Because we, you know, and Greg especially, he always makes movies just on the way he sees things, the world that he lives in. And that's what I, you know, uh, Greg's, Greg's and I relationship and friendship have revolved around that we live in this very similar world together and see things in a very much the same way. So uh, it's nice to see, you know, that you know, when you make something for outsiders because you're an outsider, because you're an outcast, and it speaks to so many of you. I think for us, again, it's, it's, it's more than anything we could have asked for. Because we were just kind of, just saying how things were for us at that time. Right, I mean, were you both like in that same 4AD sort of shoegaze culture? Exactly, yeah. I mean, Greg certainly turned me on to some of the creation stuff. But before that, the things that we had in common were we listened to exactly the same music, everything from the Cure and the Smiths to Skinny Puppy and Nitzareb and Front 242. And we were, at the time, we were heavily into industrial, as you guys can tell. <laughs> um, Nine Inch Nails being another really big, I think, influence for us, because he had just released The Downward Spiral. He was just about to release that. Yeah, if you don't mind asking, how did you guys first meet? Because he became so formative like, in his film, through like the Juliana Messina to his Fellini for a while there, like, what is the backstory? That's an interesting story. I moved, I mean, I grew up in, in Los Angeles, but I moved to Hollywood when I was 18 and was just kind of loitering around this ice cream cafe coffee shop on Melrose. And I used to hang out there before I moved there when I was in high school. You know, I'd get my bi monthly check and go spend it all at the record shop there. <laughs> and I started seeing this kid hang out at this cafe that I started hanging out with after the record shops. And I'd see them in there quite often, probably over the course of two, three months. And one day this kid, who happened to be Greg Araki, walked up to me and asked me if I would be interested in making movies, that he was a no-budget filmmaker, kind of like this, makes these queer John Hughes movies. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I kind of thought, well, you know, I mean, why the hell not? I, I understand, I mean, John Hughes, I grew up with his movies. Queer John Hughes, I can relate to that too. So um, this is original. Yeah, send me the script and you know, see where we can take it from there. You know, and I honestly didn't think it was going to go anywhere. To be quite honest, uh, I had you know I showed up to the audition and did the audition. And next thing I know, he had me reading with all the other actors. Yeah, and that was kind of like I think I got the part. <laughs> That's amazing. And like looking back to, it's, it's crazy 28 years, it's crazy to say it. Yeah, like, it's, it's like a vividly or seeing this movie for the first time, but like um, how much of Jordan was in you? Like was that where you as, as sort of soft and curious as Jordan, was that something that you had to bring into the character? Like how much of, of him was reflected in sort of your own demeanor and where you were at at the time? Um, I took him from the most innocent parts of myself that I was still, and I, I think there's still an, an inherently a big part of me, but I was very lucky. Um, when we, we made Totally Fucked Up together with Greg, we shot it over six months. So sometimes we shot once a week, sometimes we shot you know two times a week, sometimes we wouldn't shoot for three weeks. But that experience with all of us who were between 18 and 21, you know, six, six basically like teen kids and early 20 kids, we were so rambunctious and crazy and crazy view of the world and I think Greg was kind of you know taken by that at least you know according to him became a big influence for what Doom Generation was and 
my character in Doom, he wrote specifically for me off the experiences of making Totally Fucked Up. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, so, and, and Dark from Nowhere as well. Which, by the way, Nowhere is coming out later this fall. Yeah! Woo! Yeah! We're, we're as soon as we can. So, we really want to record it in this month's festival, um, but we're so happy to hear that it's going to be released. And then you told me you have some footage, right? Extra. Yeah, uh, 12 deleted scenes. Wow. Ooh. Yeah. All right, so if you guys don't mind, um, can we make a video to say hi to Greg? Yeah. <laughs> so, Brett, I'm going to stand over here. All right, everybody, say hello to Greg Rocky. Hello, Greg Rocky. I love you. We love you, Greg. Bring <laughs> Oh, behind us, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yeah! yeah! But um, yeah, uh, let's all thank you know Greg for this because really this all came from you know his heart and his mind. And, you know we were speaking about this earlier, this crazy wild road trip that our characters go on, and it has such this dark, bleak ending, you know. But when Greg was writing this, he always knew something was going to happen to them because these kids are. <laughs> These kids are out, you know, being crazy and finding themselves in the conservative America. You know, America just can't stand for that. Um, but more poignantly so, it was based off a true story of something that happened to kids in his town. Mm. And that ended up in Doom. So it's kind of how it became the Doom generation. Well, like I told you outside, like this was the movie, you know, when I went to see it, my circle of friends, this was the first movie I saw where I really literally felt like that's that's us, like reflected in a movie. And that was why it was so formative. I just kept going back and seeing it over and over. And so it's always been so grateful for the moment he captured in this film, in music, in style, the and how LA it is with, I don't know if you heard me cheer back there when Perry Farrell was on screen. There's a lot of LA sort of heroes in this movie, Perry Farrell, Heidi Fleiss, if you consider her a hero. Uh, <laughs> she is to some. Straight <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's all these incredible Parker Posey, I heard you guys know. Yeah! Oh, yeah. He's got, like, you know, one of the great lines. That's one of them. We, I mean, yeah. the response to Doom, because Doom was our first big movie, you know, for Totally Fucked Up, we did it on a very small budget. And his other movies, as we were speaking before, he had three movies before Totally Fucked Up. So The Living End, most of you might know, but I don't think yeah. most of you know Three Bewildered People in the Night, his very first movie or The Long Weekend of Despair. Um, so he was writing these gay movies in the late 80s and early 90s, and certainly, they, I don't know if anyone here has seen The Living End, for example, yeah. part of the queer new wave that broke out, but yeah, that's a dynamically awesome film that has all the trimmings of an action film. And this producer had come up to Greg, and he said, you know, you make these crazy, crazy movies for like gay people, like, if you, I'll give you a lot of money if you can make a movie like that, like, but heterosexual. <laughs> so Greg was like, I'll make the gayest heterosexual movie you ever seen. And that is literally sort of how the whole story for Doom came up. And he was like, I got something for you. <laughs> that sexual tension and then something breaks it up every time. Yeah, well, you know, one of our favorite stories, like someone came up to Greg one time and was just sort of like, I saw Doom Generation and it made me, it made me go gay. <laughs> and we're like, well, then our job is done. <laughs> so I have more questions, but I do want to turn it over to the audience. Um, does anyone have any questions? Put your hands to fall. Yes, right over here on the left. Um, out of the movies you worked on, let's say favorite soundtrack out of them. Ooh, that's tough. It's either it's he's got to be either this or nowhere, or you know. But Donnie Darko's got a great sound. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe nowhere, but only because that has more songs in it than all of the other movies <laughs> together. There's probably twice as many as this. Are there any fellow Splendor fans out there? Am I the only one that loves Splendor? Okay, good. All right, one, two, all right, cool. <laughs> I feel like Splendor never gets brought up. Splendor, Splendor, well, okay. Splendor, Splendor will come. They will eventually get to Splendor and then to Mysterious Skin afterwards and Smiley Face. And <laughs> eventually right there. But I, as far as I understand, he's in the middle of working on Nowhere Now, and then he's going to go back to Three Bewildered People. Oh, wow. So for those of you who are, who are true fans, which I think is yeah. most of you, check out Three Bewildered People in the Night. 
because that soundtrack is also fucking awesome. <laughs> I mean, to, the soundtracks to all his movies are unbelievable. And the, and the testament to Greg, and when we met, is because, and I'm sure it's like that for most of you here, is we live our lives by these soundtracks. This was, I mean, this soundtrack was one of my all time. It was just a study, like in the car, on disc, right? Back in the day. Uh, <laughs> non stop. Like, it's one of the best soundtracks. If you guys don't have a Jim Generation soundtrack, it's well, before you know, before we yeah. start shooting, he gave Jonathan an Xavier tape, he gave Rose an Amy cassette, and he gave me a Jordan cassette. Yes. And he gave us all cassettes about the like, soundtrack and the mindset of our characters. So he really has, you know, detailed, intricate idea specifically of what he's looking for and what he wants. That's awesome. So I have a question. So Doom Generation comes out, total fans. Two years later you do Nowhere. In the middle, you do a little movie called Independence Day. <laughs> How did that happen? Because I remember seeing Independence Day and I'm like, it's it's Doom Generation, it's Jordan like it just blew me away to see you in this huge movie. And I love that you went right back to doing indies and doing another Greg Rocky movie, but just like, how did that happen? Because it just went from one right to the other, it seemed like. Right. That's a really interesting story, too, believe it or not. So I met Greg Rocky in a cafe and started making, and became an actor and started making movies from there. But when I was like, okay, I'm gonna become an actor now, I saw Totally Fucked Up, I had done Doom Generation, and I was like, okay, I think I can try and do this now. So I got a job as an actor in a restaurant. And, wait, and, the, and one day I remember there was this French restaurant in Hollywood called La Poubelle. And yeah, which means the trash or the garbage or the fridge, <laughs> the wastebasket. And that, oh, God bless her soul, I love Jackie Bellman. She used to come up. She's always a very excited French woman, you know, thick French accent. She's a very big Hollywood director. So I want you to sit your table. Like, Jackie, look, I'm not here to smooth with your customers, okay? Right now, I'm just an act. I mean, I'm a waiter, so I need to be the best waiter you have because I suck as a waiter. So I need to work really hard. At this. I need to concentrate. And I walked up to their table, and I had a poster of Totally Fucked Up on the door that they put up for me. And it hadn't come out yet, but it played at Sunday. And I walked up to the table and started to take their order. And the director, Roland, you know, kind of said, Star Wars, looked at me and said, Oh, hey, that's, that's you on that. Totally fucked up. You did the Greg Rocky movie. I'm like, well, yeah. How did you see that? And he's like, well, I was in Sundance. I always go to Sundance. I love The Living End. I love Greg Rocky's movies. I, wow, I thought you were great in that. So, are you still acting? I was like, well, yeah. Can I take the order? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was sort of, and, then, and it was really kind of matter of fact. And he's like, well, I, you know, and I think this is right after Stargate came out. So it was December '94. And uh, it was him and Dean Devlin, and they said, well, do you have anything else going on? And I'm like, well, it turns out I have another movie with that filmmaker named Doom Generation, gonna play at Sundance this year, maybe we'll see you there. And he's like, yeah, maybe we'll see you there. And I just, you know, I gave him his food, did the table thing, didn't think anything of it. Then we do the Sundance Film Festival, and I'm walking down to do the Q&A, like, kind of like I came down tonight, but at the very top, you know, at, I'll, I'll, say, I'll first say this, after we screened this movie in 95, at the end of it, it was silent. <laughs> it was like people just- Cowards. Yeah. And it was like, and you know, we all took a deep breath because we were like bracing ourselves, you know, for, for, for who knows what. And I remember, just as I was about to walk down, he taps on me and I look at it, it's Roland Emmerich sitting at, and he looks at me and just goes, oh Jimmy, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I won't be working with him. <laughs> Yeah, and, and went, well, yeah, and we did the Q and A. Went back to L. A. and he didn't come back into the restaurant. <laughs> three weeks later, after I forgot all about it, he came back in with Dean. It was sort of like, Jimmy, wow, that was just a crazy movie. That's crazy. <laughs> but look, sorry, we haven't been in touch. But we were in Mexico. We just wrote this script, this tiny movie called Independence Day. In fact, it's Dean's idea. What are you doing this summer? Because you'd be great for one of the parties. And then I'm sort of, well, okay, well, turns out I'm doing another movie with Craig Rocky called Nowhere, and I'll be booked for that, but maybe we can make it all work out. And he sent me, sent out for me, called me for an audition. I went, did the audition, and decided that he wanted to cast me, and then I almost didn't do Independence Day, but Greg and Roland really wanted to make it work, 
So there was a big actor, I think it was Scott Glenn, and his schedule was conflicting with mine. And so they ended up not going with him and they went with Robert Loggia, God rest his soul, from Scarface, <laughs> who plays the lovable general in Independence Day and gave me the part. And so the way that ended up working out was I filmed one week in LA on Nowhere, and then I took my earrings out and switched my part, <laughs> shot for a week in Utah on Independence Day, and then my earrings back in and came and shot a week on Nowhere, and then finished Independence Day in Utah, then finished Nowhere in LA, and then finished Independence Day. And so it's kind of, I actually shot them at the same time. But I remember after that, what it, when I was actually shooting it and Doom Generation came out and the reviews started coming out about how crazy this movie was. And Roland was dancing on this, like on all past the trailers, like, oh, I got the guy from Doom Generation. <laughs> he was so happy that it was such a this thorn in Hollywood's side. And at that time, doing this big Hollywood movie, all I could think was, I think I'm in the right place, only in the sense that he, the reason, part of the reason I'm in this movie is because of his love for Gregor Rocky and Greg's movies. And having a character like that in his movies was something, you know, especially which you, which you can see now in his later works, was something that he'd always wanted, but was very much a commercial filmmaker and wasn't at that point moving in that quite in that direction. Yeah. That's awesome. So sorry to be so long, but it's this crazy story. That's awesome. Yeah, it's like, I, I remember I just, I was kind of freaked out after the world tour for Independence Day. Because it's as big as getting private jets and meeting like mayors in Berlin. It was wild. And um, I'm just a normal down to earth guy. You know? So I remember that day too. I was just like, look, I mean, these big movies are great and I'll do them, but I really want to focus on making little movies that mean something mm -hmm. to me. I don't need to be a millionaire and live in a mansion. I just need to be happy. We were talking about outside, I mean, between, I mean, it's, and there's so many, it's May, but I mean, between this, for me, like this, Donnie Darko, and SLC Pond. These are three movies that, that people really deeply love, you know, that are also informed by music and scenes in music. And is that something that you, with intent, go for? Like, when you're auditioning, do you look for projects like that? Because it, it, it's, they're just, beyond the fact that they're cult classics, and they've got this cult following, they are informed in, in a big way by music. And, and I'm wondering if that's something you gravitate for. I, I definitely gravitate that towards that more than anything, I think, just because it's my formative years and the way I was raised when I started you know, acting with Greg and all throughout the 90s was very much in that style. I saw C-Punk being there. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. we got we do a little <laughs> Q&A and give out some pins tonight. So. Woo! They're falling out of my body. <laughs> But yeah, the music music has always been the central key for me. With, with Donnie Darko, I just got lucky, to be honest. I had seen this movie called Rushmore. I love Jason Schwartzman, yeah. And I was like, I want to give me a movie, give me an audition with this kid from Rushmore. I really want to do a movie with him. I'm like, okay, Donnie Darko. Got you this movie, Donnie Darko. And he was cast as Donnie Darko. And I went in an audition for Donnie Darko, and I got the part for Frank. And then he dropped out. Um, from a scheduling conflict. But he he was very helpful in the sense that I think he brought on Alex Greenwald from Phantom Planet, who plays the bully, um, who was awesome and very supportive of the film. And then, of course, we got Jake, who you all might have heard of. Jake yeah. Jake. And, you know, I remember filming the first scene with Jake on the golf course and just kind of looking at me like, <laughs> yeah, and I took the mask, I was like, oh, you bad darn <laughs> could Couldn't be anyone else. I love Jason Schwartzman, but it's, I can't imagine. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes anyone, but yeah. I mean, cause some, so sometimes I also try to pick scripts, you know, not even necessarily for the roles, but for who's involved or who's making it, you know. Because I know throughout my career, I've always gotten, oh, what's your ideal role? Like, what would you love to play? And then you get the script, and you're like, wow, this fucking sucks. <laughs> and then you get something where like, oh, there's just this gardener who's like. Sounds fucking horrible. You read it, you're like, I have to play this. I have to play this. So then it ends up being in the content of the writing and not and what I thought the role was. Like struggling lawyer, drug addict doctor. No. You know, it's 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 really more about this the conflict and I think the journey of the character. That's what I've become most attracted to. And 
you know, Ken, I think you can see what we do with all of Greg's movies and being raised with Greg, it was like, your characters have to start somewhere and they have to go through something and they have to end up somewhere else. And it's like, that's what I look for more than anything. And then I'm just gonna totally fuck you over in the end, like with nowhere to take a war. It's like, why are these yeah. movies so mean to Jimmy Duvall? That was, that was supposed to be a series, believe it or not. And nobody wanted to touch you yeah, out. We wrote it for HBO and then HBO was like, mm mm. <laughs> You know, now they're doing Euphoria. <laughs> yeah. Which is, I love it, but you know, we tried to bring them nowhere. You know, we made the movie, and the movie was supposed to be a pilot, and I have episode two. Wow. And there is an episode, I think there's an episode three and a four that he ended up writing, which I'm still trying to get out of him. <laughs> yeah, but maybe, maybe I'll, save, I'll save some of that, that nowhere trivia for when we come back through for nowhere. I tried to get Nathan yeah. Bexter to come back. You come back for nowhere? Oh yeah, all right, we'll be back. Woo! Thank you for being awesome. 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 tonight. But he's busy this weekend, so he couldn't make it, but he said to send everybody here his love, and right. if you would be kind enough to show nowhere, he will be here for that. Yes. Very cool. That's awesome. Ready for that. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm happy to, yeah, go over here. Um, I think it, <laughs> it was awkward, but it also created a camaraderie between us, if that makes any sense. Because I think the thing, the thing is, is and, and Greg and I have spoken about this at length in the last few months while we've been touring with the movie, is it's a lot more sexual than what we really were doing. The way we film it, the way we perform it, the simulation, a lot of it's below screen, like it's cut off here, so you actually don't, like for example, one of the things I love is when I'm reading Greg's scripts and he says, you know, like for instance, when we're having sex in the bathtub and we're losing our virginity and X is watching us and he starts to masturbate. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, when you're reading it in the script, it's like, so X is watching and he reaches and he slowly goes down his torso and he reaches down into his pants and grabs his, off-screen cock. Off-screen, of course, because this is a family film. <laughs> it's written into the script. <laughs> so you're reading these things, things together, you're like, oh, this is gonna be great, this is gonna be great. Um, and I think, if anything, what's really impressive to me is how much more sexual the film comes off than what we were really doing. I think, because you, because at the same time, when you're doing those scenes, like when, when we're doing the scene in the tub, you know, we're surrounded with this crew who's just sitting there watching. You. <laughs> so you have this massive group of people just looking at you. <laughs> so you're like, try, just trying to think, I hope they're not allowed to be thinking, I hope you can't see in my mind going, is this good, are we done yet? Is it, don't, should I come again? <laughs> yeah. I was 21 when I made this. I was 18 when I made Totally Fucked Up. And 21 here and 22 for now. They're great films, so thank you, that's amazing. <laughs> and in pencil. Uh, yeah, that, I hope that answered the thank question. You. You're welcome. Hi. Hi, so you mentioned Euphoria. I'm curious, how do you feel uh, Mark Smith's anti-fascist movie influenced the film? Like, how did you feel about it? Yeah. And then what do you think of independent filmmakers' status as opposed to a more political filmmaker like Hollywood? Well, I know at one point Greg was like, fuck! <laughs> <laughs> but, but at the same time, it's like, we knew when we made the movie we weren't making something that was going to be a movie for everybody. Um, and we still know that, which is why, to be quite honest, the fact that it's even sold out here tonight for us, we always felt that we were making a movie for particular audiences. <laughs> you know, so we understood why some people were offended by us and didn't like us and got mad. And some people were going to come along and capitalize on what we were doing. Um, but as filmmakers, you know, it becomes, I think it's much more important, you know, to not really focus on those sorts of things and just focus on what you want to make and just keep making them. Like the, I, I think certainly like one of the things that Greg and I have been talking about over and over in the last few months is how much harder it is in some ways to make your movies. I mean, it's easier because the technology's there. So everybody can make one, but it's a lot more difficult to get it out there because you have so much more to, to weed through. And for 
to try to get distribution for the distributors to get it out there. And, you know, everybody's trying to follow some fad or what's, you know, this is the type of movies that are in right now, so this is the only type of movies we want to make. And you have to decide for yourselves as filmmakers and artists, painters, musicians, writers, whatever it is you do, that what you make, you make because it's an expression of you and it's something you just have to put out. And hopefully some people get it, but if they don't, that's, that's all right, because you're just gonna keep making it. Yeah. Yeah. And if I can, real quick before I take the next question, I really have to say, you guys saw the trailer for Moon Garden. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw the screener for last month, and I have not fallen that hard for a movie in a long, long time. Like, come back and check out that movie. That's not a shameless plug, it's just that freaking amazing. So, if you see one movie here in the next few months, check out Moon Garden. Yeah. It should be out on Criterion in the next month. It's out now. It was out on Criterion now, and um, I know that the Blu-ray is coming very soon. I think Greg said the next few months, possibly. Um, he's so proud of this cut that you just saw. It's never looked like this, not even when we originally made it. It's never sounded like this, certainly. And when they did the transfer over to the VHS, a lot of the sound quality was lost, and of course it was like in a pan and scan, and it was on the little widescreen. So Greg was kind of always, you know, it was kind of a bittersweet thing for him. We were happy that it was out, it was kind of a thorn. Um, there was also this R-rated cut, I don't know if you guys are aware of it, that was floating around, that is offensive, because <laughs> of everything that they cut out to, because basically when we screened the film for the MPAA back in the 90s, they said that they found the whole basic tone of the film offensive. <laughs> <laughs> and so, to get an R rating, because we were never trying to get R rating, it couldn't, it just got, had to be non rated. And, you know, for distribution, you have a blockbuster cut that has to have a rated R cut. So they went and just started butchering it, cutting it, cutting it, cutting it, cutting it. So, like, I think they cut 20 minutes out of this movie. Yeah. So, you have these. The movie doesn't quite make sense. They're offended by the sex, yet the whole scene when we're in the black and white hotel room and she's like, pull it out, hit it against your knee, throw it against the roof. And they, cut, they cut all that too. They cut all that stuff out. You know, when we're talking about sex, and it's really actually a sweet, you know, moment of bonding before it gets sexual. You know? They just cut right to the sex. And, and then it's just, we found the whole thing, I know I do too, but I'm not as offended as him, but you know, I find the whole thing to be quite baffling. He finds the whole thing to be quite offensive. And then even the version that, that came out that wasn't the R-rated version had things removed. Like for, for, for those of you who, like seen this movie a million times and were like, I don't quite remember seeing Jordan's dick in that guy's hand. Mm -hmm. you have, we haven't, right? Yeah, Unless you were at Sundance. Unless you were at Sundance. Yeah. So yeah. One of the first things that after we screened it at Sundance is Samuel Goldman picked us up and they said, We'll pick up your movie, but you gotta cut that out. No pun intended. <laughs> and Greg cut it out, and by the time we got to Toronto six months later, it still wasn't enough. They were still so freaked out by it, they just sold us overnight to Trimark. And, you know, Trimark did do a little push, but it was disheartening for us to get picked up by a big studio like Sandra Goldwyn, and then for, us to drop, for them to drop us and get kind of relegated to, you know, as kind of, no offense to Trimark, but like this kind of backwater distribution company. Um, you know, that being said, we couldn't be happier, and I know this, I'm speaking for Greg when I say this, so all of you who've seen this on a Russian bootleg or lent <laughs> out those tapes until they wore out and made copies of those copies, we are eternally grateful to you. So thank you, we love you. And we now have this beautiful new cut for you. Yeah. I'm just so, I'm so happy. I'm so happy that you guys got to see it. I'm happy that we can screen it. It's gonna be a staple here. Uh, we have like a certain limit of Blue Bell that we play like once a year. We have like these certain list of films that just keep coming back because we just wanna share them to new it's audiences. A, new people it's an honor to be a part of the, honestly, be yeah. listed with those movies. You know, Blue Bell, for instance, like David Lynch is one of Greg's biggest mm. you know, inspirations. Mm -hmm. so, so tell us about the buttons you got. I've got some buttons here you may have seen Amy wearing in the movie. <laughs> and eat, fuck, kill. Yeah. So, yeah, we've got a handful, so we'll just do a little trivia thing uh, between Logan and I. 
We'll just start asking questions, and uh, if you know the answers, we'll give you a button. Yeah. Maybe a Dorita. <laughs> you go first, huh? Okay, um, we've been asking this a lot, so ever seen the videos of us doing a Q&A might, but I just love this question because I love this song. What's the name of the Cocteau Twins song in the movie? Okay. Pearly Dewdrop Drops. Okay, um, yeah, reference. well, raise your hand, but it's not Pearly Dewdrop Drops. Someone, is that Bluebeard? Not Bluebeard. Not Bluebeard. Summer Lake. Summer Lake. It's on it's the B side of Bluebeard, I think. Uh, it's my turn, all right. What is the name of the slow dive song that plays at the end? Yes. Blue Sky and Clear. Blue Sky and Clear, that's yeah. right on. And so actually, yeah, so the next one will be Slow Dive has two songs in the soundtrack. <laughs> so Slow Dive has two songs in the soundtrack. There's two other bands that have two songs in the soundtrack. Just name one of them. Wait, um, but call it, you want to pick some? I just whoever shouted it out, so. Jesus and Mary Jane, that's one of them, yep. So, that's one of them, but I will give you a second chance. There's one more band that has two. That's the second one. All right. This is cool. That's fun. Greg just chucks them out. He's like, here! Anyone over 40 here? All right, so there's a news. There's two newscasters in the film. The male newscaster is from a very, very famous 19... Yes. Brady Bunch. Who said Brady Bunch over here? Someone said Brady Bunch. All right, you said Brady Bunch. Right there, right over here. Can you name him? Don't get the button anyway, but... Was it Chris Knight? Chris Knight. Yes, Knight. Very cool. Peter Brady. You got quite a lot of very interesting cameos in this Yeah, well, we have a Brady in nowhere. I don't know if I should make this a trivia question. Anyone know who that is? Jam Brady, that's right. You get a pin too. You get a pin. <laughs> so who who has it? Who is it? Over here. Uh, someone had it. Yeah. Right, come on, let's let's see what it's another one. Let me see. We have some. Well, there's some super hard ones. We can ask. Okay. Them. We can also ask Greg a Rocky questions. No more questions are okay. Uh, here's, here's one because you barely see her face, so you kind of have to like be in the know on this one. But the, at the liquor store, who plays the wife that comes running? Mar yeah, sorry. Mar Margaret Cho. Margaret Cho. Cool. <laughs> Margaret. I just finished doing a movie with Margaret a couple years ago that was here for the Film Thread Awards. We won the best what the fuck of the movies and stuff anyways of the year. Oh, that's right. Is that the one that we won here, right? Yeah, I, ch I challenged her with, I, with uh, Margaret. Oh, she's fucking great. Okay, I got one. All right, so there's a very, uh, there's a few characters in this film who say, the bitch, I'm gonna find her, and I'm gonna kill her. Yes. That's not the answer. The question, that's not the question. The question is, that line is a reference by a song by what band? Throw Coco Cole. Cole. Right over here. Where is it that? Right over here. Well done. This is fun. So it's like one movie trip. Yeah. Music t-shirt. Cocktail Twins t-shirt. Nice t-shirt, sir. I love your shirt. Thank you. All right. Your turn. I, I'm, I've got to think of one. How many more pins do you have? Uh, <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. I got <laughs> one, two. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. The Japanese band on the soundtrack. Well, that's Pizza Pot 05, but I already have a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, who's the bartender in the scene with Parker Posey? She's the one from uh, Married to Children. That's right, Amanda Pierce. <laughs> we were so jazzed to have her that night. Like, it was her and Parker in the same place. Right, there's a really tough one I don't think anyone's going to get, but I'll ask it anyways. Because some of the things is, uh, you couldn't, there were there were things that Greg and I didn't notice until we saw the re restoration, the 4K restoration. Like, oh wow, you can read that bumper sticker now. You can see someone see his face. So in the very opening of the movie, there's an actor from Totally Fucked Up behind me being kind of like, 
by a man and a woman while he's uh, sexually, not, not literally, <laughs> right behind me. But there's an actor from Totally Fucked Up. Do you know which actor that is? Most people, it's a tough one. It's Lance May, he played, he plays Stevie's brother. Totally fucked up. Oh, you got this. Yeah. Oh, that's wild. <laughs> <laughs> we, we got like, well, this would be a nowhere one, but who, okay, so, who from Totally Fucked Up Who Played My Lover is in Nowhere? Does anyone know the answer to that question? This is a tough one. But someone actually got this at the last screening. Okay, so in Nowhere, there's a character named Handjob. <laughs> yeah, he plays my lover and totally fucked up. Yeah, it's Alan, that's the actor Alan Boyce who started in, um, started a movie with Keanu Reeves. Uh, his name escaped me right now, but uh, it's really just no, it was before that. It was after Reeves. Blue Reeves in it. I can't remember. My friend plays the best, Keanu's best friend who commits suicide. I, I thought of one now. Okay. In Nowhere, there is a 90s pop music heartthrob in the film with a short-lived musical career. Oh, Jeremy yes. Jordan. Jeremy Jordan. Wow. Yeah, Jeremy Jordan. That's it. That sounds incredible. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That's, that's, I'll, I'll take it over. I'll take it over. You come up with the next one. So let's see, what's, what's, the, what's another new question? I don't know, that's like how I know. Um, actually knew that. <laughs> Octo Twins t-shirt guy, right on, here we go. Uh, While he's thinking, any other questions? Yes, right over there. It's a great question because Greg is very particular with his dialogue, but at the same time, he's extremely collaborative. So it was the entire experience for me from the beginning, even to now, I still feel like we collaborate every time we get together. I know, you know, for for Kaboom, for instance, before <laughs> I, I had an inkling he was making something because we were sitting eating and we just said that to me was, I don't know, Jimmy, what, what, what kind of guy do you, what do you want to play? And you're like, I don't know, I guess I want to do something like, people think I'm homeless and I'm like, I'm <laughs> and that's how I ended up as the Messiah of Kaboom. <laughs> so there's, he certainly kind of, you know, I can say that a, probably a, a lot of the early dialogue in Doom Generation Nowhere comes from me, too. So ball liquor and nut liquor uh, <laughs> somehow became me, but that's what I used to use. <laughs> nice. I'm curious to know, like, with the resurgence of these films and them being kind of brought back into the conversation, is, has, has there been any conversation about, is it inspiring anything, Greg, to sort of return to this aesthetic or to, you know, to, to recall that sort of... Oh, yeah. I mean, well, you know, Kabo Kaboom was the first, I think, time we had kind of gone back to the, this universe. But more recently, I don't know if any of you had seen Now Apocalypse on Stars. Yeah. But that now apocalypse is going to turn. There was a second season of that that has been written. And hopefully, I mean, it's still not out of the question that it still may come back if we can get some financing. Right so um, we were ready to do the second season when Stars pulled the plug on us because the guy who brought us on got fired. Um, but uh, I, like I said, yeah, I think there's still a good chance that now apocalypse can still come back for a second season as well as Greg is. Constantly, he's very prolific, so he's constantly writing and has many, many things in the works. Many, many. You know, he's certainly some roles that I'm too old for now, but he's attached me to stuff in the past that just never got made. Like one was called uh, The Separation of the Earth Off Its Axis. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, never made that. I just saw the script and the picture. I'm like, oh, he's got the script. Oh, he's got, he wants me to do it. And he never sent it to me. <laughs> well, it never got made. It never, in all honesty, he made up. He ended up making great movies. You got time so, for a few more? I do. God bless. All right. Yes.
I, I have, and Greg has, and one of the things that I think has been incredible when I met Greg, because he's you know ten years older than me, was he always had this youthful mindset. He still has it, and uh, I think I, I like to think I do too. So I, you know, I'm much I'm much older, but I still kind of live like I'm you know in my twenties. I think Greg does too. So we're still up there very much in the same mindset we've always kind of been. I think the only difference for us, I know sometimes it's like, we make these crazy movies, yeah, I think, you know, I was saying this to him before, I'm like, we're strangely well-adjusted. <laughs> <laughs> we're strangely well-adjusted, but you know, I think, you know, we got lucky, it was a different time, you know, and a lot of the things that, you know, I mean, we've certainly made some strides, but a lot of the things that we were afraid of, that we were fighting against have come full circle and are back in front of us, unfortunately. Uh -huh. So this is why it's more important to have than ever to keep your voice loud and proud and strong. question um because greg and i were talking at length about this in san francisco just a couple weeks ago um because we're always in, in for us it's the most incredible thing to hear about when, you know when someone's made a movie that's moved them so much and if it's been a movie that we've made we would i it's it's really quite mind-blowing because i know for, for greg and i what we're moved by is actually the music so all the characters and lines come from bands and songs, and it's sort of the same for me. Um, you know, ever since you know working with Greg, every time I make a movie and create a character, I have a soundtrack for him. So, where we find a lot of our motivations and our inspiration comes from all the punk rock, industrial music, alternative music. Um, for instance, like this movie is a lot more industrial, you know. So this movie's a bit angrier, I think, a little bit more. Like has a little bit more growth than nowhere, mm -hmm. but nowhere certainly has. You know, I think it's got this energy to it, but it's 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 not as industrial as this movie, if that kind of makes sense. But um, yeah, we've you know, it's in in music. I think before even movies or anything where people would call out sexuality or call out social you know issues, before anybody would even re they'd be singing along, not realizing what they're singing. And it was the idea that you could be that subversive there. And there we, there's an arena where we could be free and really kind of get away with it for, we think, a much longer time. Um, so, yeah, you know, I know, I know for us it, it literally does come from the music. So, you know, going back even to the question before with collaboration, when Greg and I talk about characters, when we talk about movies, we talk about songs and the situations and songs and the lyrics and songs and the way it makes us feel. And, you know, we were kind of, you know, Logan and I were speaking about the way the soundtrack to Robin Guthrie from Cocteau Twins' soundtrack in Serious Skin kind of brings this whole other dimension to the film and how music moves and affects us like that. So, you know, uh, yeah, it's almost like we take this, what we feel musically and put it, push it into the cinema, the film genre, and, you know, try to make this visual medium of what we feel, what we hear. Too. I mean, well, like, as, as, what's up? Well, uh, just to clarify, yeah. like, so Smiths would be one, Skinny Puppy would be another one, um, bands that we, you know, had looked up to, and still, like, The Cure is another one. Still got it. Did you guys hear that? <laughs> the Cure. Oh my God. <laughs> the new Cure is unbelievable. <laughs> so I was on my line, like, like Greg, we, we couldn't go to the, May 23rd show, so Greg sent it to me, someone put it on YouTube. And even though we weren't in the same room, like we were bawling <laughs> while we were this, like there's a new song on there called, um, there's six new songs on there, but one in particular called uh, The Last Good, or said The Last Goodbye, Nothing Like Goodbye. It's, it, I can never say goodbye. I can never say goodbye. I, I, halfway through that, I just couldn't stop crying. 
I couldn't, I was so moved, I couldn't stop crying. And that was the first time I heard it, I'm listening to it live. And so that, in particular, are where we find like our heroes or icons in those moments. Someone who can make you feel that way. Really just penetrate right in the core. Like, we just pop it on, I haven't seen her, it's gonna be a kid, and I'm like, well, like, it's Coachella. And all of a sudden, I'm weeping openly, <laughs> profuse, profusely, for <laughs> five, 10 minutes. Every song, I'm like, oh my God, he did it again. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, what you're describing that was captured in this movie, like when she's looking at the Thrill Pole Cold album. You know, she misses a record collection. She misses a record collection, and, and I mean, that, you know, it, it, if you're a fan, you can relate to that. But, and that specific album, too. I mean, and that, that I think is like, you know, going back to the icons, like when this movie came out, like, Rocky, uh, Todd Haynes, I mean, they were my icons at the moment. And because there weren't a lot of films that were coming out that, uh, that were not only queer, but also stylistically subversive. And queer. And, yeah. and, and you know, the, the Sons of Five, which I referenced earlier, you know, you had to go find those movies. You would not see them in Redondo Beach or in Remember mm -hmm. Torrance, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's where I, where I grew up. It was, you know, it was a lot, you know, I, I'm, I'm so glad I was doing it with Greg because. You know, I can definitely say, like, if we were to talk about cinema icons, for Greg and myself, one of them would be Bill Dar. Yeah. Would definitely be one. And it was in film school that when one of the courses Greg was in, they gave him Bill Dar, and all of a sudden something woke up in him. Masculine and feminine in particular. Oh, man. And uh, it changed. It's not just inspired, but it changed his style of filmmaking. And so what we see today, and how, you know, formative that was for him. And then of course, once we started working with him, it was the same thing after we did Doom Generation Before Nowhere, we did a little film short that no one's ever seen with Jordan Ladd and Greg's boyfriend at the time called There Is No Time For Dreaming. And he made cassettes for us on that as well. And then we sat and we watched Jim Jarmusch movies and we watched some Godard. So we did have homework in that sense before we made these movies, before we got on sets with each other while we were rehearsing. To me, that just kind of seems like a natural progression to do things. And so if you love music, like what's the thing you do? You have your friends come over and you listen to music and you drink or smoke or you go out and you drink and smoke and listen to music. But it's music is almost always involved. You know, go like we were just all in Cruel World together, you know, like from band to band. And, uh, yeah, but it's so music seems to be the backdrop of everything. Yeah. Well, and again, like the you know, going back to the theaters, I mean, Sunset Five is long gone, the Bijou, which was in Hermoso, our son, a lot of art house films is long gone. And so it, it is just surreal to just come full circle and, and keep that format alive. And I, I say it all the time, it's all of y'all keep the Frida going because it's it's exciting to be able to have survived the pandemic and, and to be an art house that's still going, to keep movies like these on screen because it's new generations. It's not, you know, the, the audiences that I, I'm always excited to share movies like this with is, is really those of you who've seen it a million times or have missed the opportunity to see it in the community with people and see it on the big screen, but really those of you who've never seen it, like it's not the same to see a movie like this on TV, uh, at home or on your own, right? as it is to be in a sold out crowd. So fucking hey, thank you all. Yeah, yeah. especially, especially yeah. 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 I've always, you know, when I started off, I mean, I've always been proud to you know, come from the school with Barry Rocky. Um, but <clears throat> there is something also important, like you say, to preserve these films and to preserve these genres, you know? I know when The Living End came out, which is another, like, oh, I really love that movie. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Todd Haynes had Poison, and Tom Cannon had Swoon, and Alice Nanders had, you know, uh, Gaps Booted Lodger. And you have these independent filmmakers who were breaking out and making these movies about a world that they lived in, what they saw films that moved them. And in turn, because they were honest about it, when we watched it, we were moved and we connected. And so that's the idea to never lose a hold of, because I'm sure you're all hearing about the writer's strike mm -hmm. and the actors are just about to join. And it isn't just about money, it's about AI. It's about not preserving any of this stuff anymore. It's putting it in a computer and spitting out new results. And we'll lose, we'll lose our humanity, we'll lose our heart, we'll lose our soul like that. You know, computer writing your scripts. Computer making your music, computer singing your songs. <laughs> all the designing, writing your own, all the computer. Yeah, and 
you, you'll get something, but you won't get something like this. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, right there. Um, of the three characters you've played in this trilogy, which is the which is the one you connect with the most? For a long time, it was Andy, who totally fucked up. But then I don't want to say that I connected with him completely because he ends up killing himself. <laughs> and I did end up finding, yeah, I did end up finding salvation. I think probably if I was closest to any of them would be Dark. That monologue that I have at the end of Nowhere is, I used to say that to Greg a lot. So I wasn't really completely surprised I had this monologue about. Because it was, it, it's still, I think it, and then in this, where it, in the sense it hasn't changed from generation to generation. I mean, who doesn't want to find at least one person to love you that you can love? Mm -hmm. And let it be that simple. So why is that so fucking hard? You know what I mean? And that's a universal, I think, you know, issue that we all deal with and face. And, you know, you have that love and you find it, you realize it and you lose it. Or you have it and you find it and you never realize it. Well, that happens in nowhere, which no spoilers, but that can happen to you, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 like to look, I like to look at, you know, I like, for me, Doom Generation 2 and nowhere, and totally fucked up, like, someone was asking how, to, how I would, you know, classify those as a genre. I'm like, those are, I think it's, it's simple, they're coming of age movies. Those are coming of age movies, they're just not coming of age movies for Apple Pie America. <laughs> It's coming of age for those of us who that wasn't our coming of age. Uh, probably time for a couple more. Thank you for staying so late with us, man. That's awesome. Oh, thank you for having me. I think I got a couple more buttons. Oh, sweet. Uh, right here. So I'm going to go right around, right around here. Yeah. All right, right here with the. Uh, yes. It's, it's a new print, but that, that shirt does still exist. So it's pretty much every shirt I wear is totally fucked up. And my ministry shirt and Doom Generation are all Greg's shirts. <laughs> <laughs> so he still has those, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I haven't been that in yeah. yes. uh, I thought the yo-yo scene was kind of important. Do you still know how to play a yo-yo, or do you still like Yeah, I actually have that. Yeah, I have been. I, yeah, I had a fan at the New Art Theater come and bring me that exact yo-yo in that box. Yeah, so I don't have it here, but I know that someone took video footage, so when I, they called me on stage, I came up with the yo-yo. <laughs> Dude, thank you. Speaking of, where where did you, sh the, the really sort of eraser-heavy industrial, like the smoke, and you're just walking, oh, where was that, that shot? That is heartbreaking. That was shot at a drive-in theater that they were demolishing. So all those were big piles of, you know, those driving theaters have the big, you know, the big concrete way for you to park your car. So all those got torn up and were just piled up high in asphalt in this huge, empty, it was a massive lot. It was an old abandoned driving that was being torn down. Yeah, end of an era. They all have more residents now. <laughs> yeah. Last question. Huh? Last question. Is it last question time? Last question, yes. All right, right over here. What's, what's on my, um, well, Love and Rockets, literally, I just got it two days ago, I got it yesterday. Love and Rockets had an album called Sweet F.A. And believe it or not, even though it comes out on the 9th, I pre-ordered it, I'm also friends with, with the guys, so I ended up getting a copy of something called My Dark Twin. And it's a two CD compilation of 12 unheard songs from the sessions that no one's ever heard. And then another 10, versions of songs that no one's ever heard. And so I'm grooving pretty hard on that new Love and Rockets right now. Nice. Um, there's also this other kind of uh, it's kind of dream pop shoegaze band called the Motifs. Huh. Anyone's ever heard of Motifs? Also Ariel. Ariel. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They, just, they were just here on tour, oh, yeah. so Ariel, I'm grooving a lot on Ariel right now. There's another band that was touring with Ariel a couple years ago that I've become quite fond of called Topographies. You guys know them? It's, it's some one of the guys from The Cure, and the band is unbelievable. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's really actually, like I said, this music's so big for me. So I'm also, there's a band out of Ireland called The Clockworks that I'm a really big yes. fan of. Oh, yeah. And I love The Clockworks. Um, God, are you at the Ariel show? 
Did you make the aerial show in LA? Like, oh yeah, I was there. Oh yeah, I definitely like, missed that for the world. That's awesome. I had to go see Jeremy. Okay, so we got the last question alert, but I have a couple more pins. You want to do more trivia? Are we, are we good for the evening? What do you think? I know, I thought it was just great. I'm good. You're good. Okay, let's do, uh, do another couple of trivia. Maybe five minutes later, and then we'll call it night. Yeah. That's All awesome. right, cool. So, shoot. Um, we'll ask a Noah question. Um, Okay, I, I just want to give the pins away, so I'm not going to make a Um What TV show is the Teen Idol from in Nowhere? It was from a famous, famous TV show. I don't do That's one of them. I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> but the, the, the Teen Idol that rapes egg. Baywatch. Baywatch, that was it. So Baywatch was one. Who said Baywatch? <laughs> James! <laughs> this is my friend James. <laughs> I didn't even see him until just now. And who said 90210? You're welcome. <laughs> all right, sorry a lot. It's all good. Folks, <laughs> one more time for Jimmy DeVall. <laughs> We did it. Okay, it happened. So please, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Right on. So you'll be back for nowhere. Yeah, I'll be back Sweet. for nowhere. So we hope to see you all here. And when I come back for nowhere, maybe I'll have Greg, but I guarantee you all at least have Nathan Bexton, or perhaps Rachel True. Or I'll, I'm going to drag some of the nowhere people out. Yeah. I know that they. Eager and waiting to come out and meet you all once we have a re-release ready to go. Very cool. Everyone, thanks for being here. Have a great day.